Donald Trump called him tough. Rush Limbaugh read one of his articles live on his radio show. Ann Coulter tweeted that article to her one and a half million followers and declared, every sentence is perfect. Ladies and gentlemen, your host, former chief editor of the Jewish Press, Elliot Resnick. Welcome to the Elliot Resnick Show, enemy of the mediocre, the milk toast, and the mendacious, champion of the excellent, the honest, and the uncompromising. This week, we're honored to have on the program John Rosemond, one of the most popular parenting experts in the country, and author of 11 best-selling parenting books, including The Well-Behaved Child and Making the Terrible Twos Terrific. He is also a much sought-after speaker and writes a column that is syndicated in 200 newspapers across the country. Dr. Rosemond, you're probably the most conservative parenting expert in the country, but you weren't always conservative. You even once worked for a parenting hotline where the standard answer to everyone who called up for advice was love your child more. How did you go from that job to where you are today? Well, it was a uh, rather um, long and involved process. First of all, that was in the mid to late 70s. Elliot, I was working at a community mental health center. I was three to six years out of graduate school. And um, I, I really, at that point in time in my career, I believed in the saving power of psychology. And um, uh, then in 1980, I, I had an epiphany, courtesy of my son, uh, first child, Eric, uh, whose third grade teacher informed us halfway through the school year that she was not going to promote him to the fourth grade. He should not have been promoted to the third. He was reading a year and a half below grade level. This was January of that year. And he was, quote, the worst behaved child she had seen in 20 years of teaching. Uh, according to the uh, Diagnostic Guidebook, which is called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, um, Eric qualified for at least four diagnoses at that point, ADHD, uh, Oppositional Defiant Disorder, Bipolar Disorder of Childhood, and a Learning Disability, and all four of them on a scale of one to 10, a 10. And mind you that uh, my profession was telling American parents that these disorders were embedded somehow in the person's biology, that they were the behavioral manifestation of biochemical imbalances, of uh, genetic influences, brain differences, and so on and so forth. In other words, my profession was telling parents then, as they still are today, that these disorders uh, could not be altered uh, through strictly behavioral means. And um, my wife and I had a long discussion about the conversation we had had with Eric's third grade teacher and came to the conclusion that Eric's problems were not due to anything biological, that uh, because there were periods of time when, when he would behave perfectly well, um, but he would slip into these, uh, these episodes represented by these diagnoses at the drop of a hat. And we realized that uh, being the hippie parents that we were in every sense of the term, uh, when we began parenting in 1969, um, that uh, we had purposefully decided we were not going to raise our children the way we ourselves had been raised. And, and this was the new mantra. And psychology, the profession of psychology, was really pushing this mantra that traditional parenting was psychologically damaging to children, so on and so forth. And uh, we, my, it was my wife who said, don't you think that if we had raised Eric the way we ourselves had been raised, 
that none of this would be happening. And so in uh, 1979, 1980, we decided that we were going to reverse our parenting and we were going to begin doing exactly what our parents would have done in any given situation. And three months later, a teacher who had told us in January that there was no way Eric was going to go to the fourth grade said to us that she had seen, and she used the word miracle. She said she had seen a miracle that three months earlier, she would never, based on her experience, her 20 year experience, have predicted that any child under any circumstances would have been able to make the progress that Eric had made in that three month period. He had gone from reading a year and a half below grade level to reading at grade level, and he was now a quote model student. In fact, she said he is the best behaved child in the class. And if he continues on this track, I will have no choice, she said, (laughs) other than to promote him to the fourth grade. And he was promoted to the fourth grade. At the end of the fourth grade, he was a straight A student. In the sixth grade, he was inducted into the National Beta Club, which is the junior high version of, or the middle school version of the National Honor Society here in the South. And uh, Eric was off and running uh, from that point on. And when I began to share the story, Elliot, uh, publicly, um, I began to get all kinds of pushback from the powers that be, from ADHD advocacy groups, from my own profession, uh, from schools, um, from physicians, uh, everybody who was, I realized, profiting from the myth that these problems were caused by biochemical imbalances, et cetera, et cetera. Um, And I began to realize that psychology was not a science, it was an ideology. And it was an ideology that was greatly influenced by special interest groups, primary among which was Big Pharma. If I could, I'm sorry, if I could just interrupt you for a second, what did you do in those three months that turned your child around in in such a miraculous fashion? uh, We told him three days after the January meeting with his third grade teacher that she had said, Uh, he was not going to the fourth grade, and we told him why he wasn't going to the fourth grade, and we told him that it was his job to get to the fourth grade, if he wanted to get to the fourth grade, that we were no longer going to help him with his homework, which was a, a, a very then and now counterintuitive thing to say to this child. You know, at that point, most psychologists would be saying to the parents in question, you need to get tutoring, you need to help him more with his homework, you need to do this, you need to do that. And instead of doing anything, we stopped doing what we had been doing. Our parents didn't help us with our homework. You know, and and if we were in danger of flunking, our parents would have shrugged their shoulders and said, well, maybe you need to repeat the third grade. And so we did exactly that because we had decided upon that January meeting that we were going to do in any given situation what our parents would have done. And we said to Eric, you know, it's up to you to get to the fourth grade. No more help with your homework, no tutoring, no counseling, no medication. You know, if you want to get to the fourth grade, figure it out. (laughs) He said, I'll never forget this. He said, Dad, how am I going to get to the fourth grade if you don't help me? And I said, I I remember these conversations almost word for word. It's almost uncanny, Elliot. They were such paradigm defining conversations. I said, um, well, Eric, if we have to help you get to the fourth grade, then Mrs. Stewart, his third grade teacher, is correct. You shouldn't be there. You should only be there if you, on the basis of your own efforts, can get to the fourth grade. 
and he got to the fourth grade. And I, I thought, well, hold on. You, you know, willpower does not override genetics. You can't will yourself to have an eye color other than the eye color you were born with. Willpower cannot overcome a biochemical imbalance that is genetically frozen into your genome. Uh, and, and I began to realize, you know, my, psych, my profession is not a science. We're not testing any of our hypotheses. We're simply inventing these hypotheses which have no empirical basis whatsoever. And we are uh, persuading parents of the legitimacy of ideas that have no proven legitimacy. And uh, we are doing, as a consequence, more harm than good. And, and Elliot, my, my profession, when I began to make this public, my story with Eric and also my realizations concerning my profession, my profession turned on me like a pack of wolves. I had gone, I went from being the golden boy of psychology who was, you know, advertising all the benefits of psychology uh, through my newspaper column and, and books, to being a pariah. And uh, since that time, my licensing board, the North Carolina Psychology Board, has attempted to take my license away from me on three occasions. It is only through the good graces of excellent lawyers that I have been able to repel these attacks. Um, the Kentucky Psychology Board tried to suppress my column in the state of Kentucky. Uh, I took, I sued them in federal court. I won in federal court in 2015. And by the way, after taking the Kentucky Psychology Board to federal court and winning, um, I have not heard a peep from my psychology board or any other psychology board in the country because they don't want the bad publicity that accrued to the Kentucky psychology board to accrue to them. You would think they would let one person in the country disagree with them, but I, I guess not. Well, <laughs> the, the, uh, the, the variable in that, the, the, the critical variable is that I am one person with a nationally syndicated newspaper column that is tremendously popular with parents. I'm one person who has written 20 books on raising children, uh, a number of which are bestsellers in the genre. I'm one person who goes around the country and as a public speaker, so I, I'm one person, but I'm a very visible one person in the field. And I like to say that I am the, not a, but the uh, fly in the ointment for the psychology profession. I'm the thorn in their side. You have many interesting ideas. Well, they're only considered interesting because we've gone so far away from traditional parenting. But I'd like to uh, go over some of the ideas that you have, which nowadays would be considered controversial. So number one, you're not a fan of instilling self-esteem in children. Why not? Well, uh, <laughs> uh, before I answer the question, most people think that I'm just spewing my opinion. But in fact, um, I can point to uh, very credible research done by credible people, peer-reviewed research, that supports every opinion that I have uh, concerning the raising of children. Um, the, uh, I don't believe that self-esteem is a good thing because A, there's been excellent research done which uh, counter, contradicts that conclusion. In fact, the research done indicates that people with high self-esteem uh, tend to be sociopathic, they tend to be narcissistic, they tend to be abusers of other people when they don't get their other way, their way from other people. 
they um, they also tend uh, to have to be prone to episodic uh, uh, situations where they they fall into states of severe depression because the world doesn't affirm their belief of themselves. And uh, the second reason I don't believe in high self-esteem is because the Bible, both the Old and New Testaments, uh, clearly says high self-esteem, high regard of the self, is counterproductive to a proper relationship with God, our Creator. Um, another thing you're known for is uh, being opposed to giving kids drugs for things like ADHD. Why? Because these, well, there's a number of reasons. Number one, because these drugs, unbeknownst to parents who are never told this and who don't know to ask the question, none of these drugs, no psychiatric drug, Prozac, doesn't matter what which drug, no psychiatric drug has ever reliably outperformed a placebo in double-blind clinical trials, which are the gold standard of clinical trials, which is why the Food and Drug Administration vets a psychiatric drug according to a set of standards and a process that is 180 degrees different than the standards and vetting process applied to a drug that uh, is designed to deal with a verifiable physical disorder like leukemia. So the FDA says uh, to Eli Lilly when they come out with, uh, when they're vetting Prozac, that Eli Lilly only has to give them this is a for example, three double blind clinical trials in which the drug outperformed the placebo. Well, so the question is how many trials did Eli Lilly have to run on Prozac in order to come up with three trials in which Prozac outperformed the placebo? And the answer is who knows? Because Eli Lilly is under no obligation to inform the FDA, well, we had to run yeah, 75, we had to run 150 trials in order to come up with three trials where the drug outperformed a placebo. And insiders have told, have testified to the fact that concerning various psychiatric drugs, there are times when the drug company has had to run hundreds of trials hundreds in order to come up with three, which is all the FDA requires. So these, these drugs are placebos, Elliot. If they don't outperform placebos reliably, then they are by definition placebos. Now people will sometimes say, well, well wait a second, John. Uh, my uncle was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and he takes, you know, whatever drug and he can't live without it. And I go, yeah, right. The placebo effect uh, has been verified. It's a very powerful effect. And so, yeah, what your uncle is taking is a placebo. And it is the placebo effect is verified to be very powerful. And so your uncle is responding to a placebo. Now, this low standard for these drugs that you're talking about, are these same standards applied to regular drugs or are, they, are, or are these only for the psychiatric drugs that you're referring to? Only psychiatric drugs. Psychiatric drugs are vetted by the FDA this way. And drugs designed to ameliorate verifiable physical conditions are verified this way. So you've got this disparity. Why is there a disparity? Well, there's a disparity because no one has ever proven 
that any psychiatric diagnosis represents a biological condition. This is a myth. Now, it's like an urban myth. It's not true. What people think it is, people say, well, what about schizophrenia? I go, no one's ever demonstrated that there's a reliable biological component to schizophrenia, which blows people's minds. There's not, no, there's not. Well, when people say biological, they mean more inherent. You don't, you don't believe that people are born, let's say, with inherent tendencies to one direction or another, maybe born weird or born crazy or born something of that nature? No. <laughs> there's, there's no evidence of that. America's uh, leading uh, uh, evolutionary geneticist said that there is no such thing as a predisposition. It's another myth. Well, clearly some kids are born more with uh, their, you know, a little bit more wilder tendencies than other children. Some children are more docile by nature. Other children, by nature, they want to run around more. Um, we're all born with, 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 with different tendencies. Some of us are angrier by nature. Some of us are more humble by nature. We all have inclinations to, one, to certain traits, good traits and bad traits. True. So, but I mean, some people, sorry, go ahead. There's, there's no indication that these traits, these personality traits, uh, predestine or predispose a person to a psychiatric problem. Well, let me ask you, I guess, another way of asking the question. Supposing one could prove that with a particular child, these drugs, in fact, drug him up. They make him more tired, more docile. He's behaving better. Um, if you could prove that with a particular child, would you still be against giving that child those particular drugs? Yes, because uh, these drugs, unlike placebos, which these drugs are, in effect, and which research has verified, unlike placebos like bicarbonate of soda, which is oftentimes used as a placebo, these drugs have potentially dangerous side effects uh, and, and that uh, mitigate against prescribing them for children. Okay, let me just go a teeny bit of a different direction because I want to get to some other items. Um, I, mean, I sometimes uh, just think to myself in terms of, of these drugs, even if some of them are perhaps helpful here and there in certain cases, or the placebo effect, whatever it is, we're born as human beings with free will. Part of life is to try to make choices, make moral choices. And the answer to making moral choices is not to drug somebody up so that he's too dead tired to misbehave. A child is misbehaving, the solution is for him to start behaving, not to drug him up so that he's too deadened to do anything wrong. But that's just my take on it. Um, you know, uh, Elliot, um, every toddler, if you've ever lived with a two-year-old, every toddler ha exhibits behaviors that, according to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, represent various psychiatric diagnoses. Which is why, by the way, we now have many examples of psychiatrists, physicians, psychologists in certain states prescribing these drugs for children as young as two years old. Because as I tell people publicly, and it, it always generates laughter, but I'm being serious, according to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, some children are not born with these traits and others are not, every toddler has attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Every toddler has oppositional defiant disorder. Every toddler is bipolar. If you've ever lived with a two-year-old and you read the diagnostic uh, criteria and the diagnostic and statistical manual, the criteria are describing toddler behavior. Yes. What is what transforms the antisocial toddler into a pro-social human being is not a drug. What transforms, and history tells us this, what transforms the antisocial toddler into a pro-social human being is proper parental discipline. Ah, but the psychological profession 
as a group en masse in one voice in the late 60s, early 70s, began demonizing the very kind of discipline that historically successfully brought about that transformation. So my first grade class, for example, and th this was relatively common in the United States in the early 1950s, my first grade class, 1952, contained 50, 50. One teacher, grade teacher, had fewer problems in a year with 50 children than today's first grade teacher with an aide or maybe two aides is having with 25 children in the first week of school. I guarantee it. Why? Because today's parents have been persuaded by psychologists and other members of the mental health professions that the very discipline that brought about the transformation I referred to a moment ago is in fact psychologically harmful to children when in fact the research clearly indicates that children of the 1950s, their mental health was 10 times better than the mental health of today's kids. How do you explain this? I mean, I, th I see modern parenting theories really starting in the late 1960s, the same era of the sexual revolution, of feminism, and of the reject rejection of religion. So I see it at heart as part of a general rebellion against God and tradition. Is that your interpretation as well? Absolutely. Precisely. It is, it is a rebellion. It, 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 it's postmodern. Elliot, and, and anyone who understands the paradigm of post-modernity, which is the paradigm in which we are living today, Germans refer to it as the zeitgeist of the times. Uh, anybody who understands post-modernity understands that the success of this paradigm depends upon the successful demonization of biblical principle and the successful demonization of tradition. You know, we are, according to the postmodernists, we are moving into the transhuman age. And uh, people don't, be, because e even in communities like, like the Jewish community, the Christian community, people don't understand that this is biblical prophecy being unrolled in front of us. The transhuman age means what exactly? The transhuman age means that, well, it's, it, I'll try and simplify this. Transhumanists believe that Darwinian evolution has come to an end and that it is now man's responsibility to further humanity, to further the human race, uh, using technology. And uh, so we are, uh, we are entering the transhuman age where certain scientists are experimenting with things like nanorobotics, where we have basically uh, mic microscopic machines injected into us that will alter our thought processes and alter our behavior. And uh, I mean, this is verifiable. It sounds, it sounds crazy. <laughs> you know, the, there are people out there probably right now, Elliot, who are shutting this podcast off. You know, Elliot Resnick is, is interviewing a nutcase. But uh, yeah, it sounds nutty. But go read about transhumanism. This is, what, this is where we are going with this, uh, this extension of Darwinism um into the future um what do you make of the modern of the popular parenting advice to always give children choices so for example instead of instructing your child say hello to my friend mr goldstein you would ask him 
Would you like to say hello to my friend David Goldstein? Or would you rather hide behind my my skirt? Right. Um, yeah, giving choices to children has resulted in children, for example, being picky eaters. So uh, I, I'm a member of the last generation of American children whose parents, let's just take that as an example, didn't give us choices when it came to what we were going to eat for dinner. Uh, we ate what our parents had decided to fix. And our parents had not decided to fix whatever meal they had fixed or your mother had fixed based on what you, a five-year-old child, liked. It was, this was healthy food, a vegetable, a meat, a starch, you know, whatever was on the food pyramid at that point in time. And uh, we were told that we were going to eat what had been put in front of us. And we did. And then psychologists came along and said, oh no, children need choices. They need to be empowered. They need to feel like they have a voice in their own upbringing, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, um, so now we have kids who, uh, I mean, five-year-old children. Uh, John, a parent will ask me, and, and I get this all the time, John, I have a five-year-old, I have a seven-year-old, he won't eat anything but chicken McNuggets and French fries. And they have to be from a certain McDonald's. They can't be from the closest McDonald's. They have to be from the one across town because somehow my son, seven years old, has figured out that the French fries over there taste better than the French fries at the McDonald's over here. And so, John, either my husband or I are driving a half an hour uh, every day after work to go get our son chicken McNuggets and French fries prepared at the McDonald's that's 10 miles away. I mean, I hear these sorts of stories, Elliot. It's craziness in American parenting. And, uh, you know, this is the kind of thing I'm counseling with parents concerning all the time. To me, it's self-evidently crazy. But to those people who, to whom it's not self-evidently crazy, why is it crazy or why is it wrong? Maybe more important. Well, let, let me tell you what has caused these people to believe that it's not crazy. They have been sold to the idea by, again, the mental health profession. And this, this concept has no evidentiary basis whatsoever, no objective, verifiable basis whatsoever. They have been convinced that their children have sensory disorders. And so... They have been told by psychologists who buy into the, the, you know, the, the, the propaganda being disseminated by my profession that their children's tongues don't taste broccoli the way you and I do. And your son, you taste broccoli and it tastes good. Your son, seven years old, he tastes broccoli and it's bitter and sour, and he wants to spit it out. And you, the parent, have to accommodate this sensory disorder. And, and this is craziness. There's no proven reality to this at all. All of this, these explanations are pulled out of thin air. They are invented and there is no uh, research process by which any of these ha explanations have been verified. I wonder if we could also bring it in, into the moral realm, if you don't mind, because I think part of the problem, at least the ones that I have with choices, is because you're giving the, the option to, for, to the child to do the wrong thing. Would you like to say hello to my friend or would you like to ignore him, basically? Would you like to go to bed or would you not like to go to bed? Would you like to do the right thing right now or you don't want to do the right thing? Then when he says no, you have to bribe him to do the right thing. Essentially, you're giving him, instead of instructing him to be a moral human being, you're giving him the option to, be, to do the right thing or would you like to do the wrong thing instead? Yeah, well, this is moral pragmatism, of course. I mean, you know, the, the implicit message, message is 
you, you are only obligated to be a pro-social and therefore moral human being if it suits the almighty you. And the child becomes, within this paradigm, this parenting paradigm, the child becomes the almighty. He is, you know, I said to my wife the other day, because uh, a friend of mine was talking to me about her first grandchild, who is now 18 months old, and whose mother, every time the child cries, picks her up. And the grandmother asked me, what do you think of that? And I, I simply said, well, either the mother trains the child or the child trains the mother. And what's happening in that household is clearly, and the child is only 18 months old, the child is training and has successfully trained the mother. And if anyone thinks that the child is not thinking this through, they're mistaken. The child is, in fact, thinking this through and knows that if she cries hysterically, the mother will appear and pick her up and do what she wants the mother to do. Now, Elliot, who's in charge here? You know, I believe that parents should be, should function uh, as God's proxies in the raising of his children. And so it is a parent's job to properly reflect, reflect God's unconditional love and God's unequivocal authority. And this is not what parents are doing. Their, their love has become enabling, and authority is completely absent. A except, you can call this authority if you want, occasionally these parents who function as enablers, which the mother of this 18-month-old is already functioning as, Occasionally, these parents who believe it's all about love and don't balance this with proper authority, they explode on a regular basis toward their children. And they all testify to this. They explode in these, in these outbursts of frustration, anger, uh, and you know, back and forth they go. They explode and then they make up for it by becoming enablers. And they enable and enable and enable and enable and then they explode because a child is going to obey authority. Calmly communicated. You are going to do this. You, when we meet Mr. Goldstein, you are going to say hello. You are going to look at him. You are not going to hide behind my skirts. But these are parents who would, as, as you put it earlier, would you like to say hello to Mr. Goldstein? Don't you think it would be nice if you said hello to Mr. Goldstein? Mr. Goldstein would feel better if you said hello. You know, and the, the child is receiving no clear message from the parent as to what they should do. And so they do whatever they please. You know, their, their instinct, instinct, for lack of a better term, is to, no, I don't want to say hello to Mr. Goldstein. And one reason I don't want to say hello to Mr. Goldstein is because you want me to. Because children are naturally oppositional. Parents fear that if they're strict with their children, their children will either rebel or grow up emotionally stunted. What's your response? Well, this was the, uh, this was the propaganda that my profession began to disseminate in the late 60s and early 70s. I was there. I was in graduate school when this propaganda uh, became vogue. And the psychological profession, with no research whatsoever done to verify this propaganda, began promoting it in one voice. And, and I was part of the voice uh, until I had the epiphany that I described earlier concerning my son in 1980, 
when he was in the third grade. Um, uh, the, the word strict needs to be defined. What is strict? Strict is simply being unequivocal. You know, this is what you're doing. This is what I expect. I am not going to accept anything less than this. Now, l let me remind you that when this was the way parents communicated authority, uh, unequivocally, calmly, straightforwardly, uh, the mental health of children was 10 times better than the mental health of children today. You rarely hear parents talking to children like this anymore. Uh, in the first place, the mother is now the person who is doing the parenting. In the 1950s, uh, the father was head of the household. In the 2020s, the mother is the head of the household. There is no doubt about it that the American family over the last 60 years has shifted from being male-led to being a matriarchy. And mothers are reading parenting books, fathers are not, because fathers, they understand implicitly. In the final analysis, they have no say in the raising of their kids. No say whatsoever. You know, the mother does not have to ask the father, do you think this is okay when she makes a parenting decision? But heaven help the father if he makes a parenting decision and independently carries through with it without consulting with the mother. The rules are now very, very different. And this is not the fault of women. It's not the fault of women at all. It is just simply the way the cards have fallen as a consequence of psychological parenting propaganda. And uh, strict, strict is nothing more than just simply telling children what to do. Today, your job is to mow the lawn. Okay. I, I tell parents all the time, children, and the word I use is submit, even though it sounds like a bad word, it's really, a, a very functional term. Children submit to the proper communication of authority. And you want children to submit to the proper communication of authority. You want them to obey. Why do you want them to obey? Because common sense will affirm what the research has discovered, and that is that obedient children are also the happiest children. So parents who say, I want my child to be happy, my response is, then you need to learn how to communicate authority to your child such that he obeys. Because obedience is not a matter of the proper selection of consequences. Obedience is a matter of how you speak to a child. It's a matter of your tone of voice. It's a matter of a brevity of language. It's a matter of your body language. It's a matter of how you communicate. And you'll watch this in, in parent populations. The parents who have the most obedient kids, and it's not a chicken and egg proposition, the parents who have the most obedient kids are parents who are very relaxed, very straightforward, and very unequivocal. Bobby, it's time for you to go to bed. Not, Bobby, are you tired yet? Do you think it's time to go to bed? Are you ready for some sleep? Uh, mommy will sing to you for an hour if you, if you will lie down. And if you really put up a fuss, Mommy will sleep with you tonight. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, but, but Elliot, this is the kind of thing that's going on. And it's not that these are bad people, but this is crazy parenting. and. Who or what profession has informed the craziness? My profession, psychology. And it's not just that these, you said these people are not bad people. It's actually almost the inverse. It's almost, sometimes it's the nicest people who are the most permissive because they don't want to impose their authority on their children. So they're constantly trying to bend over backwards and trying to think of all these inventive ways 
and they think they're being righteous people. If I sing for an hour and a half, that's very difficult for me. But you know what? That's my mission, to be selfless and for me to do what I need to do to help my child. And so it's, it's actually the nicest people sometimes who wind up going for these more permissive um, techniques and, and theories. One of, the, uh, one of the unspoken rules in American mother culture and it has been an unspoken rule for quite some time, as you just pointed out, Elliot, is uh, thou must always be nice. Well, my mother wasn't always nice. <laughs> my mother, I mean, my mother, who is a, a good mother by, by sane standards, my mother didn't care whether I thought she was nice or not. And from a child's point of view, the, the fact of the matter is children, they want their own way. This is a definition of human children. They want their own way. You know, and they will do anything and they're very pragmatic. They will do anything to get their own way. And it is a parent's job to override that instinct with proper discipline. And you cannot override that instinct and try to be pleasing always to the child simultaneously. You either try to please your child or you override the child's natural instincts with calm, cool, collected authority. You know, I just spoke to another difference between 1950s parenting, which I experienced, and, and today's parents. In the 1950s, it, it was clear to me that it was my job to please them. Today's parents, Mothers, especially, very unfortunately, believe it's their job to please their children. And so what we have, what we're seeing, what I see, what I hear described to me nearly every single day, Elliot, because I'm in constant communication with parents all over the country, you know, even in places like Australia, Austria, you know, um, what I see is parents who are working very hard, mothers especially, to be pleasing to their kids, and their kids have learned how to manipulate them. Parents nowadays try to play the part of philosopher. They assume that every time their child misbehaves, there must be some deep underlying re reason that either they or a professional therapist must uncover. You don't look fav favorably, I know, on this type of response. You say, just treat the misbehavior and forget about underlying psychological explanations. Why? Uh, the more you pay attention to, first of all, a child's feelings are cha chaotic. A child's emotions are chaotic. Read Proverbs twenty-two fifteen. Foolishness is bound, bound in the heart of the child. A child's feelings are irrational, they are chaotic, they are undisciplined, they are untethered, uh, and they are narcissistic. And uh, the second line of Proverbs 22:15 is, but the rod of discipline will drive it far from him, which, let me clarify, does not, as many misguided, Christian pastors and theologians contend does not refer to specifically to his banking. Foolishness is bound in the heart of the child, but the rod of discipline, which is simply what I said before, a reflection of God's authority over us to our children. We are to represent until our children can understand the concept of a spirit being who rules over everything in creation, we are to represent him as adequately as we are able to, being the imperfect creatures that we are. And what today's parents are doing is they are encouraging 
the irrational force in their children by talking to them constantly about their feelings and doing this thing that psychologists call affirming the child's feelings. No, you should not be affirming your child's feelings. Children's feelings are irrational, chaotic, undisciplined, untethered. You should be telling children how to feel. You see, this is a concept that's foreign to today's parents. Let me share two things with you along these lines. I ask people my age. I take these polls as I travel the country. And I ask people in certain demographic categories various questions. They don't know I'm polling them, but I am. I ask people my age, did you, do you remember ever having a conversation with your parents about your feelings? Okay, here's the reaction. 100% of the time, I'm asking a person in their 60s, their 70s, their 80s, do you remember ever having a conversation with your parents about your feelings? The reaction? Laughter. Followed by, John, you have to be kidding me. Yuck, yuck, yuck. John, you've got to be kidding me. My parents never talk to me about my feelings, they say. Okay, so people say, oh, that's terrible. No, our mental health, and this has been verified time and time again, our mental health, 10 times better than the mental health of today's kids. We didn't have conversations about our feelings, but our parents did address our feelings. Here's the way my mother addressed my feelings quite often. I remember very clearly coming home one day crying because the other kids wouldn't include me in whatever game they were playing. I came home crying. My mother looked at me and said, you're making a mountain out of a molehill. And if this is what's going to happen to you because you go out there and play with other children or try to play with other children, then you can't go out there and play with other children. And she kept me indoors for a week. And what did, I, what did I want to do during that week? I wanted to go out and play with the other kids. And so I learned in one week, don't ever come home and complain to my mother sobbing that other kids were doing something as insignificant as not letting me play. And the benefit of this approach is that it makes children tougher? Yeah, it made us more, and, and here's the word, phrase, it made us more emotionally resilient. It made us capable of dealing with hardship. It made us capable of dealing with life when it didn't go our way. And, and Elliot, you know, and I know, what percentage of time does life go the way you would like it to go. It's not even 50% of the time. Life is all about struggle. Life is all about hardship. Life is all about problem solving. Life is not about basking in some tropical, psychological climate all of your life. That's not life. And if you don't teach children early on that life is struggle, life is hardship, life is about not getting your way, then you have very possibly doomed your children to a very unhappy existence as adults. Last question. Uh, religious parents tend to raise their children more traditionally. But even many of these parents nowadays have adopted modern parenting philosophies and techniques. And when you ask them why, they often respond, well, they are following professional advice, which is in turn based on, they say, objective scientific research. Is that true? Does, uh, does, does scientific research demonstrate that traditional modes of raising children is harmful? Yeah. 
the the work of uh, Diana um, uh, Diana I'm blanking on her last name. She's uh, uh, she was a psychologist at um, University of California uh, Berkeley, I believe, and uh, Richard Robert Larzelaire, uh, University of Oklahoma. Their research has clearly, it's been peer reviewed, it's been replicated, clearly indicated that um, traditional parenting yields a better result in terms of child mental health and, and a much better result than either permissive parenting or abusively authoritarian parenting. And um, uh, so, you know, people say to me all the time, well, you're authoritarian, John. I go, no, 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 no. You know, don't, don't be fooled by the fact that the words authoritative and authoritarian share all but five letters of the alphabet. They are vastly different from one another. And authoritarian parent is uh, very threatened by his child's misbehavior and responds to it in a very exaggerated way. Permissive parents are very threatened by their children's misbehavior and retreat in the face, face of it. So in effect, the authoritarian parent and the very permissive parent are really one and the same. They're simply acting out the polarity of the fight or flight response. The authoritarian parent is aggressing toward the child when the child misbehaves. The permissive parent is retreating from the child when the child misbehaves and giving in to the child. My position, which is the, the authentically traditional position, is authoritative, which balances unconditional love and unequivocal authority. And it's a very cool, calm, rational, uh, and, and at the same time, a very loving approach. Uh, it, it's simply telling a child what to do. And when I train, here, here's the thing, when, when I train parents, because parents have lost touch with this, so they, they need to come to workshops to be trained, trained in what parents 60 plus years ago knew how to do instinctively. When I train parents and how to communicate authority properly to a child in this cool, calm, and collected way that I talk about, the feedback from parents, and I mean, Elliot, uh, I'm going to sound like I'm tooting my own horn here, but mind you, the, these are not my ideas. I'm simply resurrecting these ideas and trying to keep them alive in our culture. 100% of the time, people tell, tell me that, that, that when they begin doing this thing that I'm training them to do, how to communicate properly authority to a child, that the response, the positive response on the part of the child is almost instantaneous. Let me just ask you a quick follow up because you've said several times now about the importance of calmly um, in, uh, conveying instructions and authority. But just a, a for instance, just a quick for instance. So you say very calmly to your child, okay, we're having dinner now. Um, and the child doesn't move doesn't want to come to the table, wants to continue playing with his toys, and you conveyed it very authoritatively, very straightforwardly, come to the table, we're eating now, and he doesn't come. What do you do next? Okay, first of all, there is no one-size-fits-all consequence. And consequences are necessary. But I, again, I will say what I said earlier, the proper selection of consequences is not the be-all, end-all of proper discipline. It is a necessary thing that you sometimes have to do. So uh, in that particular situation, I would give the child the instruction one time. This is a huge mistake that today's parents are making, and that is repeating themselves ad infinitum. Billy, I've told you it's time for dinner. Billy, you need to put your toys away. Come on, it's dinner time. Billy, stop that. Put it down. Billy. And this is where the explosion occurs, okay? As opposed to simply saying, Billy, it's time for dinner, we're eating now. And going to the table, serving people's plates, 
And Billy shows up 10 minutes later and you say, dinner was 10 minutes ago. You chose to pay, play with your toys. Dinner is over. We're not serving, we're, we're not doing two flights of service here. There is one seating at our table. If you don't sit at the one seating, then you're not eating. And I guarantee you, Elliot, first of all, the child will, he will live until the following day. He will be alive the following morning. He will not be sick. He will not be in a coma. He will not have to be taken to the hospital. He will simply be hungry. And he will have learned on one evening, when I am called to the table, I, if I want to eat, must go to the table. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Rosemont, for your time. I really appreciate it. And I hope our audience has been enlightened, hopefully, by this conversation. And if people want to follow you, I guess they would go to your website, johnrosemont.com. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, yes, and, and I have a new website that is in the process of being built. Um, it's up and running. It's parentguru.com. But if you type in johnrosemond.com or parentguru.com, you'll get to the same place on the internet. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Elliot, for having me on your podcast. I really appreciate it.